Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-Centered Leader in Confessional Broadcasting, Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. Concord Matters, the show where we seek to have the one mind of Jesus Christ found in his word and reconfessed, same said, spoken again, particularly by looking again at how it was said in the 1500s by those Lutheran fathers who spearheaded that amazing reformation of the Catholic, that is the Christian church. We're going to look particularly today at the apology of the Augsburg Confession, that is its defense, how these fathers fought back against the accusation that they were no longer teaching Christianity and that what they had confessed to be Christianity was not Christianity at all. What they did was they answered that claim with this defense, this apology. My guest in studio with me today, Peter Ill, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Millstadt, Illinois, and Sean Smith, pastor of both St. Paul's Winehill and Emmanuel in West Point, Illinois. Welcome, gentlemen. I'm going to turn your mics on. Try that again. Welcome, gentlemen. Great to be here. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Our afternoon listeners might not know, as well as our morning listeners, that I've only been running board about a week on my own. And so I have this nasty habit of not turning guests on or, say, starting AP Network News and then immediately turning it off. Uh, but it's it's coming. I at least can fix my mistakes at this point, even if I still have to make them. We're going to be picking up today, again, an apology to the Augsburg Con- Confession, Article 2, at paragraph 52, even though last week our, our hosts and guests went a little further than that, it went up to paragraph 45. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> uh, and uh, but we're gonna we're gonna back up to 42. Did I say 52? Is that what happened? Yeah, we're gonna back up to 42 just to capture some of our, our running start. Otherwise, we end up starting a sentence with but, and it's always kind of bad to start with a but because you don't know what it's butting against. You need to get back to what we're going against. Of course, we're actually going to start with a but here again as well. The point being, though, we're, we're in this defense of, I think we talked about this even last time we were together as a group, concupiscence, uh, this old-fashioned word for our original sinful condition, the curved in on ourselves negativity, uh, b- backwards focus, looking for my own passions versus looking for truth reality, that, that if I am going to make a decision, I am going to do it for an evil reason. Even if it's a good decision, I will do it for a self-inclined reason. And defending this as being actually sin, actually worthy of condemnation. And we're going to kind of be digging into that. Anything you want to throw onto that? No, I think we're going to dig into it right away here in 42, and that'll be a good place to jump in. All right, then here we go. Paragraph 42, but when our adversaries argue that the evil inclination is an adiaphron, not only many passages of Scripture, but simply the entire church contradict them. I think we should just start right there and make sure that that's clear. A lot of big words in there, as you might say, Peter, you know. <laughs> um, the evil inclination, what is that? Well, and and it has a, a parenthetical remark there in our uh, reader's edition of the Book of Concord, foams. And uh, what, what that word means is a, a dry tinder. And so this is a, an inclination that is just ready to be set on fire. Um, and that's the way that Rome is looking at it. It's, it's not actually sin. It's just we have this... Um, uh, this inclination um, that can be set on fire and and then we'll we'll do actual sins versus our entire nature is sinful, which is the Lutheran position right and then and then having no guilt and to piggyback off what Sean was saying, so many times people say, but what I did it really wasn't wrong. I just wanted to do the wrong thing right. But even the wanting to do the wrong thing reveals our sinfulness. And it reveals exactly what Jesus said uh, when it is what comes out of the heart and the mouth that reveals a man's uh, evil and his wickedness. Right. So what about this word adiaphron then? 
So the, the, the fullness, the fire within us is an Adi Afran. I mean, goodness gracious, guys, could you make it more complicated? Well, Adi Afran c- shows up a, again uh, when it comes to church practices and so forth, that things that are indifferent, neither commanded nor forbidden. And so for Rome, once again, it's not really sin. It's only a burden. It's an indifferent matter. Um this this uh, this concupiscence, but for Lutherans we say no, it's not indifferent because what is a, an offense to God, which is sin, um, can never be indifferent before God. So the fire burning within within my belly that would lead me to make evil decisions on a regular basis ain't a big deal. That that's kind of what Rome's saying. No worries. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Yeah, and the Lutherans are going to make fun of this uh, in several lines here. Well, quite a bit. Of course, they they say, you know, obviously Scripture is against this, they say, and the entire church is against this. I mean, who, who would then ever dare to say such a thing as this? Picking up. Who has ever dared to say that the following things are in different matters? Doubt about God's wrath, His grace, God's word, anger at the judgments of God. Being provoked because God does not at once deliver one from afflictions, murmuring because of the wicked, because the wicked enjoy a better fortune than the good, to be urged on by wrath, lust, the desire for glory, wealth, and so on. Godly people acknowledge these things in themselves, as appears in the Psalms and the prophets, but in the scholastic academies they took from philosophy entirely different ideas. Desires and inclinations are neither good nor evil, neither praiseworthy nor worthy of blame. And there's quite a mouthful going on there as well. Uh, Before we get into the scholastics and the philosophy, though, uh, I really want to zoom in on that list of things, which is really, uh, it's a list of the worst sins that there are, which nonetheless, notice what's missing there. If if we were going to ask somebody on the street, what's the worst sins? Um, Lying, uh, adultery, right? Stealing. Those aren't in this list. Uh, Not that those aren't sins. Those are sins. But look at what's in this list that's really quite wicked. First one, doubt about God's wrath. I mean, does anybody today even think that that's sin? No. And, and see, this is, this is, I mean, just the, the real depth of the matter for us as Lutherans and for them at that time is that, uh, s- since before the time of the Reformation, there's been this confusion of what the gospel really entails. Right. And so, uh, there's this notion that the gospel is, oh, my life is empty. Lord, I, I need you to fill it. And yes, I do these bad things here. Uh, but, but for Lutherans, we rightly understand what scripture says. I am an offense to God. Yeah, right. Right. And, 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 and especially all, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> all, and all of the, all of these things on this list make that abundantly clear. I am an offense to God and I can do nothing uh, to save myself from that, I need to be rescued. Yeah. That Thus, I need a Savior. Yeah, there's a complete and total brokenness that this list talks about. Um, ignoring God, not paying attention to his wrath, thinking, oh, I really don't have anything to be afraid of. God really doesn't have a problem with me and my sin. I don't do the big sins like murder and adultery, and uh, I'm a pretty much okay guy right. or gal. And here it says... Do you think that God doesn't care? Right. Do you ignore what scripture says? Do you think it's okay to try to sneak through some of the the white little sins? Uh, Because those are just okay. Uh, Well, no, that's not okay at all. We are, just like Sean said, completely and totally broken. And we come again and again confessing we're poor, miserable sinners. We can only be made godly people through God's absolution. What strikes me again about this list is it's... It's a way of analyzing what's going on in my own heart, <laughs> frankly. It's, it's just too honest. Uh, and there, there are three things here that they were accused of doubting. God's wrath, God's grace, and God's word, right? Uh, you could say that's all wrapped up in law and gospel, I suppose. But, uh, Peter, you hit on it. So thinking that God isn't going to really punish evil. Uh, you know, it, And like you said, uh, Sean, a moment ago, you know, I didn't mean to. Right, and so it really wasn't bad because I didn't mean to. So that's doubting God's wrath, but then doubting His grace. One of my favorite prayers from the prayers of the church. Uh, I think this comes out of the the old TLH prayers of the church, that big long one that you do every week until you you know have it memorized. But is praying for a death without uh, praying against having a death without faith. Right, uh, recognizing that it is my doubt of His grace that will greatly threaten me on my deathbed. Not my sin, but my my belief that He won't forgive me of my sin. And all of this then God's word, which if we see anywhere where it's directly attacked these days, it's people not believing in the inerrancy of scripture. Right. 
Well, and 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 to to hit on what you were just saying there too about the doubting of the grace, especially in the deathbed, and we as pastors see that quite a bit when we make those hospital visits and someone on is right. on their deathbed, and that's where the the words and promises you just you just nail at home, and and but without the understanding of exactly where you stand before God, right? Uh, that's why this article on original sin is so important. Mm-hmm. Without that, it undermines the gospel, and you have no comfort to speak right. in that moment. What about anger at the judgments of God, too? Uh, how many people who used to go to church, and it's not everyone, but people who used to go to church no longer, no longer go to church because something happened, right? Mom died. Right. Or there was a divorce. And now I'm mad about what happened. And so I'm going to hold that out against God. This, too, is being held out here as as not an indifferent matter. (laughs) Right. Right. And it's not even that uh, always that specific. Sometimes it's why would a loving God uh, allow so many injustices in the world? Why would a loving God allow for tragic death? Why does a loving God allow for uh, national disaster and calamity and fire and earthquake and flood? Why is it that God would allow these things? And we're quick to try to reverse roles with God so that we can say, God, just what do you think you're doing in this world here of mine? Right? That we're asking him to justify himself. Exactly. Ah. And then we got in a favorite of mine, I suppose, murmuring because the wicked enjoy a better fortune than the good. Because I'm good, and other people have better fortune than me, and they must be wicked. Therefore, I murmur. Yeah, I mean, it's just so. It's just I thought just I did goes. that. Yeah, no, I think it's all of us, right? Uh, and we just we just can't stand seeing the world have more than we do, and that this too is not an indifferent matter in God's sight. This is punishable sin. Right, and and all connected to it too, because what what is driving home here is that death in the world, physical ills in the world, uh, the tyranny of the devil, the assaults of the devil, and all of those sorts of things are there as penalties for that original sin. Right, and so if you make this original sin, this concupiscence, merely a an indifferent matter, then yes, as Peter said, you're, you're just merely turning this into, uh, um, well. I just lost my train of thought. Wow, that's idolatry. Terrible. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, well, I'm sorry. Yes, you you turn you turn against God, right? Uh, and instead of realizing that this is your own fault here. Speaking of idolatry, that last list, the desire for glory, right? The the, the vain hunger for me, for me to be the, 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 the at the end of the day. Maybe I'm a heretic on this one, but the the greatest sin I commit is wanting to be good without God. I want glory. I don't want grace, right? Uh, I, I want to grow and sanctify myself. I don't want to have to be justified and sanctified by God. And that is my, my greatest wickedness, to uh, uh, attempt to be outside of God and yet good on my own. And I think that's what Adam effectively ate, right? He ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he thought he was going to be better than before. It, it, I think I picked this up in seminary, but this phrase of, I am my own favorite false god. Hmm. Uh, All of the other things that we place into our idolatrous desires get there because we want to do God, we want to do God's work better. Right. You said earlier that the world belongs to you. Yeah, exactly. I I thought it was mine. And so what happens when we both think that you end up having to fight over it, right? Where does war come from? That very thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the root of, you know, we see these sort of Facebook memes and things like that, right? You know, that uh, racism is learned. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, you know, put put one toy in a sandbox with two children and you'll find where racism comes from. It's, right. They want to be their own God. They want to be in control. And and by the way, you're both wrong because I'm in control oh, here. Oh, you're in yeah. control? Yeah, well, good. Gotcha. Glad we cleared that up. Yeah. <laughs> now, they say that godly people... And they see this in the Psalms and the prophets as well, acknowledge that these sins are in us. It's not just that we acknowledge that they're there. We don't love them. We don't, we don't cling to them as if they're great. We see them and we, we despise them. And the problem with what the adversaries were teaching at this point, the Roman Catholic Church, is that they're, they're effectively denying this with this statement that that fire for evil within doesn't really matter so much as long as you don't let it kind of get out and get out of control. And this is a really good zinger that almost gets past us because they're saying here, the scholastics, the Roman Catholics are, uh, in the medieval church are saying that this is indifferent and if you have a little bit of an evil inclination, well, as long as you don't act out on it, it's fine. 
And you can just hear uh, Philip Melanchthon saying, but guys, the Bible says. <laughs> and, and, and just looking with an expectant look of, don't you expect that what the Bible says is actually going to be true here instead of human philosophy? Right. But the philosophers have reinterpreted what the Bible says by redefining the terms, which I think is what they're getting at in this next part about the scholastics, taking from philosophy the idea that desires and inclinations are neither good or evil. And this, again, struck me. I told you guys this earlier. It struck me as I was listening to something this morning where the guy was a a philosopher at Yale, I believe, talking about how morality is neither inherently right nor wrong, but it's just about trying to find what's best for the greatest number of people. It's like the same idea that we're saying here, that desire is neither good nor evil. It is only what we actually do that matters. Uh, What do we call that? Uh, It's not relative uh, moralistics. There's a word for that. Um, uh, Situation ethics, right? Right. Well, and and yeah, so this is uh, Stoic Philosophy 101, right? And that's actually where they're drawing this use of the term adiaphora mm. uh, from, is from Stoic Philosophy. You know, it's merely an indifferent manner. And you have to recognize also why they're doing this is because their basic operating procedure uh, for theology is that it is um, faith and love for Rome, right? Right. Uh, So the good works issue is in here. And if I'm seeing the lack of um, these good works, the faith, the, the lack of love towards a neighbor, um, well, then I have to have to find a way to spur you on to that for Rome, right? right? And so that's why they have this whole whole thing laying out here. And 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 Lutherans are like, no, no, you need to grow deeper in the gospel, and and love will just be the natural fruit. I mean, all of these articles are going to begin to connect together out of this when you get your basic operating. Um, theology right. Now you're really hitting in something there too, which goes further than just the, the debate between the Lutherans and the Romans in the 1500s. Uh, you're, you're getting at a, a primary disease, I would say, in the broader American Protestant Christian reality, which is the belief that if, if my faith isn't strong enough, the way to get it stronger is to do more good. Uh, which gets back to what I was saying before about how my, my great sin is in fact wanting to be good without God. When the, the opposite is the real antidote that if my faith isn't strong enough, I need to better acknowledge my evil and then have it forgiven, right? Have it declared gone and have Christ preached, have Christ in my place. See that cross placarded before my eyes. As Paul says in the one place, you know, Christ was publicly portrayed among you as crucified, that that's where my faith is going to grow from. And what you said there, I think a moment ago, Sean, is what we believe as Lutherans believe the Bible says is the result will actually be more love than if I just yell at you to love people more. <laughs> right. right. And and it plays out into so many things. That's why it's so important because you see this huge uptake in American Christianity, right? And going out to do uh, short-term mission trips and to become parking lot minister and whatever else minister Canceling of the church. church on Sunday morning can, yeah. to go out and give bread to people. I mean, it, absolutely. And, and, and even restructuring the service. Right. Um, and, and, and part of the reform of the Lutherans was to restore the, the right liturgy, which we still do when we do right, the right liturgy in our churches today, we come right in and we confess right away. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all of my sins and iniquities, right? Um, we're just laying it out there. This is the condition that we are in. Um, and and it is growing deeper in that gospel that will produce the fruits of good uh, of good works. Um, but, uh, you know, their, their whole, they're restructuring the liturgy and, and the way that you live the Christian life and you have to go and join a monastery or go off to, to Haiti on your short-term mission trips and, and do all of these loving things so that you can feel good about, you know, hope that they outweigh. Uh, and you even hear these, uh, these, um, you know, lines from, from American Christians and so forth that, you know, when I stand there on the the last day on the judgment day, I, I just want to know that, you know, my hands are, are empty. I gave all that I had, you know, it's like, no, uh, you need to stand there on that last day and recognize that you are a poor, miserable sinner. Right. You are an offense to God right. and look to Jesus and know that he is your righteousness. It's scary to think about uh, the emptiness of that or the vanity of that, that the, the need Huh. The need to try to love others so I can have more is a self-defeating reality because I can't love them if I'm doing it for me. I can only love me then. And going back to your idea about trying to be good without God, uh, the complete and total opposite of that and, and 
a wonderful scriptural blessing at the end of sermons oftentimes is the peace that passes all understanding, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ that passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds. And that's what we believe, teach, and confess, that as much as we are completely and totally evil and wicked and sinful, not only in our actions, but also in our inclinations, which God cares greatly about, as much as God cares greatly about that in his wrath and in his judgment, he also cares greatly about it in his forgiveness, right. in his mercy, and in his grace. And so where uh, earlier it said that we would doubt God's wrath and that we would doubt God's grace, we doubt neither. We believe firmly that God should be angry with us because of our sinful inclinations and our sinful actions. And we believe firmly that Jesus Christ suffered and died and rose and has delivered to us even now the forgiveness of those sins. And so we cling solely to Christ. Right. And this, I mean, this whole thing, Article 2, is leading to Article 3, which is about Jesus being the Savior. And we're, we're basically saying, look, if we don't get what we're saved from right, it's not very much use to us to have a savior. Right. The, the, you know, I, I think I picked this up in seminary actually, you know, it's, it's without the right diagnosis for a doctor, you can't get the right cure. Right. And that's, that's really where we're going here. You know, we got to get the right diagnosis. What's the problem. And now we'll find great hope and comfort in the right cure, which is Christ. The next line, which we haven't gotten into yet is, is basically giving us the wrong problem. And what we're saying is the wrong problem is this idea that sin is only sin as if it is a voluntary action. I'd love to see someone to try actually parenting their child with that philosophy that the child is only disobedient if they meant to be disobedient, right? Because <laughs> I, mean, I don't know about you guys. That's like the classic answer from my 12 year old is, well, I didn't mean to. And she thinks somehow that gets her off the hook of slapping her brother's face, right? <laughs> it's like, I don't care if you meant to or not. Look at the red mark on his face, right? Uh, it, 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 sin is not only sin when I meant to do it. Uh, it is sin no matter what what, right? But how often in our prayers do we say, but God, I tried real hard. God, I wanted to do it right. God, my intentions were good, even if my actions were lacking. Good try, but no. No, it doesn't hold up. Um, it doesn't hold up when I try to pray that way. It doesn't hold up when, uh, when other folks try to pray that way. We are all indeed broken because down to our very core, we are sinners. The reason it doesn't hold up is because it's self-justification. And we know, this is where the whole Melanchthon, like, guys, the Bible says we're not going to justify ourselves by our works. That's really all we're talking about. The entire apology to the Oxford Confession is it is about justification. And if we're going to try to teach justification by works, it destroys everything else that we teach. It tears it down. Yeah, and, and just quick aside real quick, too. We, we've rightly pointed out the big thing that Melanchthon's pointing out. You know, look, you disagree with Scripture here, Rome. Uh, that's a big problem. But he also kind of gets pretty snarky, and he says, and oh, by the way, you also disagree with the church fathers. I mean, just a couple lines early, I think it's line 38. You know, he says, let them argue with Augustine. You know, <laughs> uh, Augustine defined this for us. Which, for the American Protestant, isn't a big deal. Like, who right. cares about the church fathers? But we're dealing with the Roman Catholic Church who are saying things like scripture and tradition. Right. Well, then maybe what that tradition says is important, right? <laughs> and when it's not on your side, well, then maybe you're wrong. I, you know, I, the, the snark is there. I, I don't know. Maybe it's wrong in these days. The Catholics can be our best friends and things like the pro-life mo movement and whatnot. But the snark is there because they were they were so unwilling to even have this discussion at the time. And it's kind of done with it. Hey, guys, the Bible says this. Church says this. Let's get over it and move on. Right. Um, they, I, they The next line tells us they unwisely add other ideas as well, saying that nature is not evil. Properly understood, we do not reject this idea, but it is not right to take this understanding of what God creates as good and apply it to original sin. This is precisely what we read in the works of the scholastics who wrongly mingle philosophy and civil teachings about ethics with the gospel. I think the main the main thing to draw out of that right there is they are doing knowledge of God. They are doing theology from experience into the Bible. It doesn't matter where they are grabbing it. They happen to be going to Greek philosophy. But they're taking what they're finding out in the world and they're bringing that into the Bible as opposed to taking what they're finding in the scriptures and bringing that out to define what they find in the world. I actually got to have that very conversation with a member this morning talking about, you know, a little bit of pastor jargon because, man, what's fun without pastor jargon? Uh, 
the difference between exegesis, reading from Scripture the truth of God's Word, and eisegesis, reading into Scripture our own experiences and our own thoughts. And how many times are we confronted with a biblical passage and we say, but I don't want it to say that the the person in me, the person who understands my rational mind, my experience, and so on, I don't want that to be true. And since I don't want that to be true, I have to understand it a different way. And we try to do that all the time. Um, No, the Bible can't really say that. I'm going to try to uh, get out from under it somehow. Yeah, and and it's like uh, flying right in the face of what Scripture says. Jesus himself warns, you're going to be of a different kingdom. I'm going to form and shape your mind to think very differently than the world. Uh, St. Paul is huge on this stuff. And so when we start importing things from the world to understand God's kingdom, which is fundamentally different, uh, you're already beginning on dangerous ground. And uh, yeah, the Bible has its own philosophy. We don't need to import. No. Uh, and and what's, what's, again, dangerous is it's not like we have to we have to be doing that on purpose either. Right. My, my reason and will are flawed. It's not like I go to the Bible and like, okay, I'm going to... I mean, there are moments where, like you said, Peter, where I find a verse, I'm like, I don't like that. How do I deal with that? You, a Christian's kind of like maybe struggling with that. But the natural man in us doesn't even have to come to that position. They just simply come in and they say, oh, it must mean this. And it doesn't, it's not what it says. It's the opposite, right? This is my body. I don't like that. But they don't think I don't like that. They just think it can't mean that, right? Hmm. There's no intention on our part to misrepresent the scriptures. We just do it by nature. Because by nature, we are sinful and unclean. Right. Or broken, incapable, uh, uh, wicked. What was it? Fumus? So that, that's got to be related to fum, fumus. Fumus, fire, is, uh, and smoking, mm-hmm. I think, in, yep. in Spanish and whatnot. Uh, the fires within us that are breaking down, well, who we are in God's sight, but which Christ our Lord has come to redeem us from. More about that on the other side of this break on Concord Matters. Concordia University, Wisconsin, and Mequon overlooks a half mile of beautiful Lake Michigan shoreline. CUW campus is located 15 miles north of Milwaukee with over 70 undergraduate majors, 28 graduate degree programs, and doctorate programs in pharmacy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and nursing practice. CUW offers online learning and accelerated learning at one of nine Wisconsin centers and one in St. Louis. Traditional or accelerated education, CUW has the program for you. CUW.edu. Hi, this is Rich Robertson, President and CEO of the Lutheran Church Extension Fund. Are you a rostered church worker with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod? As a financial partner with the LCMS, we understand your unique calling and desire to stay focused on ministry, which is why you can look to us as a faithful partner when it comes to your financial needs. Our borrowing solutions allow rostered church workers and ministries to expand their spiritual work now and in the future. Learn more at www.lcef.org. Hi, this is Pastor Harrison. Let me tell you about something new and exciting. We call it Life Together, a monthly digital digest where I'll be sharing news and highlights from synod publications and multimedia outlets. There will be something for everyone. Each digest will be delivered to your inbox showing how we live and work together to proclaim the gospel and bear Christ's mercy to one another in our congregations, communities, and the world. Please be sure to subscribe today. You'll be glad you did. Since 1973, citizens of the United States of America have murdered 55 million people. How? Abortion. What are you going to do about it? This January 2017, thousands are going to march for life. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Life 360 Conference will be taking place in, with, and under this most necessary event. Find out more at lcms.org slash life. My name is Pastor Jonathan Fisk, and I'm going to be there. Will you? From Superman's comic strip debut in 1938, comics have been selling in the millions every year for decades. In those early editions, religion often played a part in the superhero's character development. But more recently, the Bible has become the story itself. 
In 2010, Kingstone Comics began publishing books in comic book format with the titles reflecting books of the Bible, their most popular entitled The Revelation. Cutter Calloway, assistant professor of theology and cultural studies at Fuller Theological Seminary, said that comics are extensions of religious learning. Comic book writer and scholar in religion and literature A. David Lewis doesn't see comics replacing the Bible, but being useful reminders of stories that link to modern visuals, engaging a new generation with this book of all books. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. Welcome back to Concord Matters, seeking to be of one mind in the confession of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and what Jesus is coming again to do, working on keeping that confession of one mind by looking at the Apology to the Augsburg Confession, one of our historic Lutheran documents forged in the fires of the 16th century Reformation, talking about original sin, sinfulness, diagnosing what it is we actually need to be saved from. My guests, Peter Ill of Trinity Lutheran Church in Millstead, Illinois, and Sean Smith of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Winehall, and Emmanuel in West Point, Illinois. And we're picking up just before paragraph 5 of Article 2 of this Apology Defense of the Augsburg Confession, in which they say, Philip Melanchthon, on behalf of us Lutherans, us, us Lutherans, says, These matters were not only disputed in the schools, but as is usually the case, were carried from the schools to the people. Well, God, isn't that just always the case? So what's the matter here? The matter is redefining good and evil to only really matter if somebody actually gets hurt, right? Uh, but that the, 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 the sin within me doesn't matter much. This idea, even though initially it was bantered about by highfalutin scholastics with their big words, one way or the other, it worked its way down into pop culture and started affecting consciences. Right. This isn't an ivory tower problem. And that's what Melanchthon is wanting to say and be really, really clear about. This is something that uh, daily, that everyday Christians, that you and me and, and everybody else struggles with, of trying to say, well, I know that I shouldn't do this, but a little bit of want to, a little bit of desire, a little bit of a fantasy. I can fantasize about sinning without actually sinning, and that should be okay because I didn't really do anything. And when it comes to having that kind of a sin fantasy, and earning the wrath of God, that is a big deal. That does matter as much as we try to tell ourselves that it doesn't. How many Proverbs do we have that, I mean, no harm, no foul, right? I mean, it's that same idea. If nobody got hurt, what's the big deal? You know, I was just playing. It was just a white lie. All of that. And and not recognizing, well, no matter how we might feel about it not mattering, God has said, this is why death is here, <laughs> right? This is why pain and suffering and starvation are here. Those reasons. And so to, to acknowledge that and not hide from that. Right. And 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 what he's saying here, too, is that what has come from the ivory tower uh, uh, has influenced the people. Because I was a little disparaging earlier, perhaps, when I was talking about uh, American Christianity and the uptick in uh, uh, going in uh, short-term missions and things like that. But the, but the thing is, is that this really does impact real sinners. Right. I mean, they need to know the comfort because we all with St. David on some level say, my sin is ever before me, right? We, we see it. We know the brokenness. You know, when, when I say, oh, I didn't mean to... Or or, you know, you know, just different things like you just said, our own Proverbs and so forth. We acknowledge that we have hurt someone and right. that there is a hurt relationship. And we have to deal with that somehow. And so we're trying to make ourselves feel better. And and what Melanchthon is rightly pointing out is this stands against Scripture and the right confession of it. Um, and so you're pointing people in something that isn't even helpful in dealing with the situation. Let's get the right diagnosis here so that we can actually treat it for real sinners who are really hurting. It doesn't really reconcile us to each other if I just tell you, no. I, I'm sorry you were upset. I didn't mean it, right? Yeah. It, it, none of that does any of this. I, this next sentence as well, we could, I could just talk about this for, for probably 20 minutes. That is why these teachings prevailed and nourished confidence in human strength and suppressed the knowledge of Christ's grace. How much of what we see in American Christianity today is the preaching of human strength? 
Right? The, the preaching of confidence in yourself. Faith has been redefined to be a term that means confidence in yourself. Just have faith. It'll all work out. Just believe. It'll be fine. Right? And what gets diminished? Grace. Christ's grace. Real, actual knowledge of the Savior. The Spirit's work in my life. I, I increase and who decreases? Jesus does. Right. And I, I can't tell you, I mean, you guys could probably share as many as I could, uh, just in pastoral experience and counseling and so forth. How many times I feel like a broken record, they come in with these prosperity gospel preachers and their books, and we all know who they are. And uh, and, and I just keep saying, I'm like, you're, you're actually hurting yourself here. This is undermining the gospel. You, you have no strength. I mean, it, and you're beating yourself up with the law on top of it all, and it's going to fail you. And you're going to, as Peter rightly pointed out in the first part of the show, um, it's going to lead to anger towards God when really the anger should only always be directed at us and our own sin. Yeah, your, your conscience eventually is going to catch up with you. Yeah. And the question is whether when it does, you're able to have it solved or whether it's become so hardened that the gospel can't get through anymore. In scripture and in the Lutheran confessions, faith is always in Jesus Christ. The idea of having faith without Jesus Christ being the object of that faith is foreign to scripture and it's foreign to the life of the church. Unfortunately, in our American pop culture and in uh, some of the American pop Christianity that we bump into, we have faith as a general hopefulness, faith faith in general, faith in the abstract, not faith in Jesus, but warm, good feelings. Um, and sometimes you even hear people talk about prayer that way. I'll pray for you is almost the same as I'm sending you warm feelings and well, yeah, I'll internet send my, hugs. I'll send my prayers your way. I've heard people talk about it as, as if I've got this kind of voodoo power. Well, yeah, I don't know <laughs> what that means, but I don't think it's probably all that good. <laughs> I, I can remember Dr. Mars when uh, I was in seminary. Uh, I can actually remember who taught me this, so I can credit him. So Dr. Mars, uh, Rick Mars uh, at St. Louis Seminary, uh, was would talk about the gospel chair. And he said, you know, the, the, the American Christianity loves to talk about, you know, f- my faith in the chair being strong enough. But what actually matters is the chair being, being strong, strong enough, enough to right. hold me, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's the real difference there. You know, when we talk about, you know, sending out these prayers and all sorts of things. We're we're talking about, you know, my faith in that chair being strong enough, which is going to fail every single time, right? I'm I'm prone to be to to fail in that. But if the chair is actually strong enough, that's all that really matters because right. I'm not going to go crushing to the ground. And 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 that's Christ. He is actually strong enough. And so we do better. The the actual salve is actually found in the strength of Christ. So just believe it. We don't put faith in our faith. We put faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Right, right. right. What, what I believe is not going to change reality, but believing in what reality really is is going to have a profound effect on me, ultimately, right? And that's where when you talked about love earlier. Love does flow from faith in the true object, in the one source, because the mercy that he literally <laughs> is pouring over this sin will not be able to but flow back out of you. It's mm-hmm. going to have an impact. It's going, to, it's going to regenerate the mind, which we were talking about earlier as well. This is why. It's all just lead up, right? We, what are we, 41 minutes into the show, and now we're where we're supposed to start. Uh, therefore, uh, Luther wanted to make clear how great the consequences of original sin are and how weak human beings are as a result. And that's what we just did, 40, 41 minutes. We want to make clear how great our, 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 our problem is. So he taught that these remnants of original sin— after baptism, are not by nature unimportant, but that we need Christ's grace so that they are not counted against us as sin, and to put them to death, mortify them, we need the Holy Spirit for this. Two things I want to jump in on there. I want to come back to the term mortify, but this idea that I still need grace all the time. Uh, I am constantly, I, or was it? it, it it's like Luther said, I think, oh, where was this? I think this was in Bondage of the Will. Um, but he, he said effectively that a, and, he, and we're going to use some big words here, right? Again, that we're going to play on this term of uh, mortal and venial sins. Mortal sins being a medieval way of saying sins that'll damn you. And venial sins being a way of saying what, the, right over we're getting here, the sins that don't matter, they're in different matters, they're adiaphora, right? And Luther said that the only sin that's actually venial, that doesn't matter, is the one you believe and fear to be mortal. Because that one you're going to take to Christ. The only sin that is actually mortal is the one you think is venial, 
when you think it doesn't matter, that's the one that you're not covered for. Yeah, I mean, well said. And and we'll, we can boil it down even more simply and just say that all sin is mortal. Right. right? Death exists because right. of sin. And, right. and uh, But and, in Christ, all sin's venial, too. Right. Like, yeah. That's the thing. Exactly. It's, like it's all yeah. been taken away, right? But you can't know that. You can't believe that if you don't believe it's all mortal in the first place. It's worth taking away. Oh, it's no right. big deal. Well, then you don't really want it taken away. Right. Huh? And then this idea of mortifying your sin, your flesh. I, I really love this term. It's one we don't, I don't know if I heard this term at seminary. It's got to be in Peeper somewhere. But the, the mortification of the flesh, the fight against my old man is, it's not a glory road. It's not a power road. It's not a strength road. It's a death road. <laughs> and it's really intense. It's no, it's no fun. No. Uh, this, this mortification and this is where we see the work of God, even as we mortify the flesh. Uh, thinking about even the upcoming scripture readings uh, for this Sunday, you know, we get to celebrate uh, the baptism of our Lord and talking about how we are baptized into Christ's death. And if we're baptized into Christ's death, we're also baptized into his resurrection. And if we're baptized into Christ's death and resurrection, it is ultimately Christ who puts us to death yeah. and keeps taking us back to, to baptism. And I know there's this old pastoral truism, but it it's a truism because it's, it's good of... Every day we drown that old Adam, but doggone, he's a good swimmer. Right. Uh, but again and again, we go back to the font and we drown him and we say, no, in the waters of Jesus Christ's baptism, where I was baptized and made new, where I was made holy and innocent and blessed before God, so let it be that... This man, this old man, this sinful man, this by nature evil man dies again, day in, day out. And it feels like you're not making any progress. It feels like you're not going anywhere and you're just spinning there on your hamster wheel. But that's not the case at all because Jesus doesn't go nowhere. Jesus doesn't spin idly on a hamster wheel. Jesus is the one who keeps coming. And ultimately, it is Jesus who mortifies our sins. It is Jesus who mortifies our sinful nature. And it's the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that makes us holy and leads to our, our sanctification and our holiness. I would say that if you think you're feeling progress, it means you're not. <laughs> yeah. And you're probably moving the other direction. The other direction, yeah. Because the progress is that I'm going to see is that what we've been talking about, the greater awareness of my wickedness, even though the progress God is making on me is that I'm less aware of myself. And so I'm actually more likely to do something good. <laughs> yeah, I might see my neighbor instead of myself, but I'm not going to see me when I'm seeing my neighbor. I'm not going to love you for me. Like we were saying earlier. Yeah. And, and picking on what you guys were just saying too, knowing our small catechism is really helpful here. I mean, what, it's what the are basics you talking of about? Crazy talk. Yeah, I know. Right. But, uh, baptism, the great Lutheran foundational thing here, right. Is that, uh, uh, Luther encourages us in the small catechism to ar arise each day and remind ourselves of our baptism. And what, how does he describe that baptism? But it's this daily mortifying that I take all of my evil lust, desires, and passions, right. All of this sin and I drown it and die, right. That I may arise a new man and live in righteousness and purity forever. Our, our catechism teaches us this simply. That's really all we're laying out here. And that is, as, as you rightly pointed out in the three-year lectionary series uh, coming up this Sunday, uh, the church is celebrating the baptism of our Lord. And that's really what the baptism of our Lord is all about, is that Christ in his baptism in the Jordan River identifies with sinners. Right. So that we, as St. Paul talks about in Romans 6, the epistle reading for the Sunday, might identify with his righteousness right. and that we no longer live in this anymore. And we do this battle daily through the means of grace, uh, the, these gifts given to the church. And so, as we talked about earlier in the show, too, all of how we do church flows forth from this, right? Am I trying to to motivate you towards good works through some sort of um, manip? manipulation or am I just making you go deeper in the gospel so that you identify more and more with Christ and his righteousness right. and there there is the growth there is the progress yeah it is it is God's identification of us and both pastor and Christian are kind of tasked with this with each other whether it's through absolution standing in front of the church or whether it's through the mutual consolation of the brethren to continually point out to each other you are a Christian. Here's why. Here's what Jesus did. And with that, there, there's not like, it's not like there's no, and this is what Christians do. 
What do Christians do? In the morning, they remember their baptism, right? They remember that, that they, or they find their sin with them during the day, and they have no choice but to drown it. How do you drown it? Call it what it is. Stop saying it's not sin and it's an indifferent thing, right? Admit what it is, and then remember where it's taken away, remembering that cross. Huh? Oh, Peter just gives me a thumbs up. <laughs> Leaves me hanging. Because I could totally see that on radio. <laughs> <laughs> I just meant keep going. Keep I, going. I've, got, I've got nothing at this point. Keep talking, Fisk. All right. So, mortification, work of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I want to <clears throat> reemphasize before we move on, the, the, here they are identifying sanctification as dying. It is not growth. It is not overcoming. It is not power. It is death. And the Christian learns to actually long for this. Not that I want to actually die. I don't. I want to live, but I want my sin to die. Uh, I want uh, the evil within me to be smothered by God and trusting that the grace of Christ is all that does this. The scholastics, on the other hand, this medieval Roman juggernaut that we're arguing against, minimizes sin and punishment when they teach that people can fulfill God's commandments under their own power. And it's not just the scholastics, it's not just the medieval Roman Catholics, it's not even just American Protestantism. There is a wide swath of historic Lutheranism that teaches that we can rise up and fulfill the commandments under our own power. And the main point here is all you're doing when you do that, when you teach that, all you're doing is you're stealing Jesus from people. You're stealing freedom. Yes. Yes. It's, that reminds me, I'm going to tell a little story since you said that. Um, uh, sometimes when teaching Bible study, like you'll, I'll say, any questions? And people just stare at me or they'll shake their heads no. And it means either what I said was so genius, so well put together that the whole world is now enlightened and we can all just kind of die happy, or I made no sense whatsoever and we are all so much dumber for having, having heard it that we can't possibly respond. And that's why I just <laughs> ask for questions, comments, <laughs> concerns, and donations. <laughs> and donations. So... In Genesis, they go on to say, the punishment imposed because of original sin is described differently than that is um, what, what the scholastics are teaching. For there, human nature is subjected not only to death and other bodily evils, but also to the devil's kingdom. In Genesis 3.15, there is this fearful sentence that proclaims, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Defects and concupiscence are both sin and Punishment. Oh, man. I mean, there's like two things in there. We don't want to go past that second one. There's still a lot of paragraph left. But the first idea there, again, being now, we're not just sinners. We're also under the devil's reign. And this is a pretty terrifying thing. Part of this, then, is that our defects, our sin, is both the problem and the wage of the problem, the result. Sin is evil's its own problem, <laughs> right? It doesn't need to be punished. It is its own punishment. Or yeah. you, oh, Go ahead, Peter. Or you could almost say, is concupiscence, that is evil desire and uh, defects, are they sin or are they punishment? And the answer is yes. yes. Yeah. They, are, they are both at the same time. And we continue to struggle in this enmity, this eneminess between the baptized people of God and the devil himself. And the devil, along with the world and the sinful nature, aren't going to give up in this fight, but neither does Jesus Christ. And that is our continual hope. And again, once again, against the scholastics, they're disagreeing with Scripture because St. Paul talks this way. He calls us slaves to sin. Hmm. I mean, that's really all we're laying out here is this, this is the nature of our slavery to sin, and that has to be dealt with. I don't want to go past this verse that they're quoting too from Genesis 3.15 because my dear old grandmother was convinced this was the reason she was allowed to hate snakes with a passion because she was a daughter of Eve and so God had made her hate snakes. And well, I don't know, that's fine if you hate snakes, but don't miss that the enmity between the devil and the offspring is not really first and foremost about us as offspring plural from Adam, but as that single offspring, that one seed of Adam and Abraham who crushed the devil's head on the cross when his own heel was crushed, and that that enmity between them is, in fact, our curse going into Jesus, right? And him absorbing it, uh, but in so doing, driving a spike through the head of our enemy. And so much of this tying into what we just celebrated in Christmas, too, is that, um, you know, in creation, we were created in the image of God. 
perfect righteousness, right? Uh, that was lost in sin. And then the very first child born is now in the image of Adam, right? right? And right. so this sinful nature comes out of that. And so we needed the the image of God in Christ to meet the image of Adam in, in the humanity and to, uh, to take upon himself all of our sin. Yeah, and that's what Christmas is all about. It's what the baptism of our Lord is all about. Mm -hmm. It's all going to the cross where he's going to take this curse that we're under, which is both punishment and cause, right? And this, again, getting back to what they're saying, death and other bodily evils and the dominion of the devil are properly understood to be punishments. Human nature has been delivered into slavery and is held captive by the devil. He fills human nature with a passionate desire for wicked opinions and errors and pushes it to sins of every kind. Just as the devil cannot be conquered except by Christ's help, so we cannot free ourselves from this slavery by our own strength. It's so wonderfully clear there. But again, I think the place where the, the normal human being is going to struggle is admitting in like a, a mirror honest way that I am filled with a passionate desire for wicked opinions and for errors. That the, most people are going to say, no, I, I, don't, I don't want error. I don't approve error. It's not what I choose. But that is, that is who we are. And it's that point where Luther says, you know, you got to take your hand and put it against your heart, see if it's beating, and then believe what the Scripture says about it, whether or not you feel it or not. Yeah, it is the truth of the matter. And, and to some level, yeah, I don't want to choose that. But by my sinful nature, I already do. I, I really have no hope in the matter but to think evil. And so uh, I, I do better to just acknowledge the problem right. uh, that I may receive the cure. Call the cancer what it is. Yep. Huh? Exactly. Lead us not into temptation is a prayer you can only pray if you actually want to do bad things. <laughs> right? Uh, lead me not. Let me not ever come into, into contact with the bad things that I wish I could do. It's such a weird prayer if you think about it because I'm... I'm praying against what I want, and yet I want not what I want. And it's all the Romans 7 stuff, right? The evil I would do, I do not do. The good I would not do, all, the, all that. is the experience of, again, mortification, sanctification, the Christian life, new obedience, faith, faith in God's word. And, and so much of that, too, they, they talk about Romans 7, um, those who disagree with this clear scriptural teaching, they talk about Romans 7 as Paul in a pre-converted state. No, he's he's clearly talking in the scope of Romans. Um, this is after baptism. And so Luther is not in disagreement with Paul here, and they're trying to attack Luther in his writings. It wasn't even right. in the, the the Augsburg Confession itself. Uh, they're going after him with this, uh, you know, the concupiscence remains after baptism. And he's like, this is just the way Paul is talking. Right. Yeah, Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am not a wretched man that I was, but I'm not anymore. No, he's still that wretched man, but at the same time, he is sinner and saint, uh, forgiven by Jesus Christ, yet still struggling as he mortifies and puts to death the flesh. It's the mystery of being both light and darkness. You mentioned spirit and flesh there as well, Paul's language in the book of Galatians. And while we have uh, not we're not going to finish with the flesh what has been begun by the Spirit. The Spirit is nonetheless still at war with the flesh within us, making us new men, new people, risen in the first resurrection of faith and uh, and sustaining us in this bizarre decrease of my vanity by its being crushed by the law and the increase of my hope by it placarding Christ crucified in my place. We've got about a minute here left, guys. Final comments or thoughts on everything that we talked about today? Well, I just want to drive home the point again, too, that the gospel is so much more um, uh, rescuing and saving when we identify the problem rightly. And because we recognize that we are real sinners, we, we really need this hope. Uh, some people will t say that we're, we're just merely uh, uh, being very depressing, talking about sin all the time and things like that. They talk about our Lutheran services and sermons that way. And it's like, no, it's actually the more positive thing because the gospel is that much. I mean, I have so much more joy and so much more hope when I believe this. The gospel is more rescuing. Today's title. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and for any Christian who is struggling with uh, this desire that this desire to sin and uh, evil and wickedness, know that Christ is bigger than your sin. Mm. Know that Jesus is indeed your Savior. It's not about your faith. It's not about your desires, good, evil, or otherwise. It is all about Jesus. 
It's not about you. It's about Jesus for you. Exactly. I think I heard that somewhere on KFUO and other places before. My guest today... Peter Ill of Trinity Lutheran Church in Millstadt, Illinois, and Sean Smith of St. Paul, Winehill, and Emmanuel, West Point, Illinois. Concord Matters, seeking oneness in mind through the words of Christ, repeating what has been said so that that gospel, that light, would not be lost and we would have hope for living in these dark and evil days. I'm your host, Pastor Jonathan Fisk. I'll be back with you with these same gentlemen next week.